Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about haunted Cochise County, a new book by author Francine Powers. Southeastern Arizona is haunted by its violent past. Some of the most notorious characters in American history once called Cochise County home. It's probably best known for the gunfight at the OK Corral, and you can pay your respects to those who died that day at the Boot Hill Cemetery. In Douglas, the ghost of young Mabel haunts the halls of the Avenue Hotel, hoping someone will solve her murder, while the spirit of a Bisbee fireman still works tirelessly to save lives. I'm Carol Hughes, and on this episode of The Grave Talks, we'll discuss those stories and more from the book Haunted Cochise County with author and paranormal historian Francine Powers. Francine, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to talk about these stories. How did you become interested in the paranormal? Um, Well, that um, takes me back to my young childhood. I'm a Bisbee native, uh, Arizona and Cochise County. I come from a family, a large family. We had uh, five siblings at the time and my parents. My dad uh, worked in the mines. Well, when I was in about the first grade in my uh, childhood home, which is on Tombstone Canyon, which is uh, Bisbee is a mountainous uh, community. And uh, our house was at the very tip top of town and we were up on a hill we started getting, you know, some typical paranormal activity. The lights would go on and off uh, at night. We would hear footsteps. Uh, we are a Catholic family. And my parents, because it became a, a little too active, and my mother had called the priest at St. Patrick's Church. And at the time, because the community and the congregation was large, we had two priests. And uh, one of them came over. He did the blessing of the house, and that's with holy water, and a a priest will recite a prayer and uh, throw the holy water in each corner of the house and then bless us, and and that is to get rid of any uh, spirits in the home. That didn't work. It actually got worse. We had, like I said, a lot of kids in the house, so I had to share a bedroom with two of my uh, siblings. It was in the middle of the night, and it was dark, but... Uh, we had the window open and so the, the moonlight was shining as so I could pretty, I could see pretty well. I woke up and I looked at the foot of my bed and there was a woman standing there and she moved, you know, to the side of me. I could see her and I had my oldest uh, sisters were teenagers and they're twins and I started calling their names and it would an answer. And then I had a, a nightstand on the side of my bed with a big lamp. If you can imagine in the seventies and all those big lamps. And, uh, that person came over and put their hands on the lampshade. I could see her fingers. They were long tapered thin. And I kept calling Stella, Sally, and she turned her head, you know, kind of sideways, like she didn't understand me. And then she walked past me again and walked right to the end of my bed. And uh, she was in, I would say, 1890s, 1900 clothing. Uh, It was her hair was up in a a bun. And she looked at me. And then I because I had sat up and then I remember laying down because I was frozen. And then she put her hands in a prayer position. And then she bowed her head and then she went through the floor. Mm. And yes, and I could still wow. see it perfectly with uh, records and, you know, with the research I did on that, uh, there was another house on top of that. It was built in 1890. But so, you know, things like that would happen. My mother woke up from a nap and looking in the hall and on the wall, she saw uh, a face without eyes. The night before we were eating dinner and all of a sudden, uh, tin cans, the sound of tin cans being dragged around the house, because we it's in a mountain. The side of the house is just a mountain. We could hear it, the cans being dragged around the house. And then we had a bunch of dogs and they started howling. And then when we stopped eating and looked at each other in the attic, you could hear someone fighting. You know, my dad went over and opened the door because there was a door and then a really steep uh, set of stairs that went up there and he did that and he opened the door and it all just stopped. So 
the following day, the other priest came and we told him. So he went upstairs. My dad was going to follow him. But then the priest went up to the very top of the stairs. He, he looked into the attic. He turned around to my dad and told him to stop. Just, you know, put his hand up and told him to stop. And then he started praying. And then he really started to pray. And he turned around. And then was, as he was coming down, he got shoved. And he got shoved all the way almost to the very bottom. And I just remember he is like pale. So he said he was going to talk to the bishop. And they end up having a meeting. And then the bishop agreed on having an exorcism on a structure, which is different than a person. The priest came, I I would say, within days. And uh, we had a mass in our living room. And we had to follow him as he had the small rite of exorcism, that prayer, and he had the crucifix in his his book. And we followed him around. And, you know, I, I detail that in my first book, Marina, Don't Be Afraid. And I actually do, I was able to do it in my second book, Haunted Bisbee. Um, I describe as going around the house. When we got to my parents' house, uh, they had, you know, they were the front of the house. And so they had uh, three windows and those were vibrating. Mm. And he was he was praying. And then when we went through the living room, you know, I could hear a a man's voice. And because there was two entities in that house, there was the woman I saw. And then there was a man who they were really trying to get rid of. I could hear him. It was getting louder. And the the wind, I could hear the wind. And the priest was looking at me because I was very little. There's a heavy door to the laundry room. And that was open. And it slammed, you know, shut. And he kept praying and then we ended it back in the, in the living room again. And, and then everything just quieted down after that, it kind of went away. We didn't hear anything. You know, and none of the things that we were experiencing before happened again. Uh, my little brother was born and we were there for about another three years. And he tells me in adulthood, he did hear a couple talking. Uh, the woman would talk to him often and then and the mines ended up closing and then my parents went bankrupt. So we ended up moving in another part of the town. But that's how I uh, was introduced to the supernatural and the paranormal. I think you win. <laughs> Yours is the best story. <laughs> you know, I think it's so interesting because a lot of people have had experiences before. I grew up in a haunted house, but nothing ever came close to having the priest come in and go through what your family went through. And it's interesting, yes. too, probably now as an adult looking back on it, that your parents let you stay. During the exorcism, yes. the, the priest the priest uh, said we, we had to be there because we had to face along with the ceremony what was happening. You know, the Catholic Church, they do acknowledge spirits and ghosts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they do have, obviously, you know, the exorcism. That's for demons. But my sisters, the twins... They were playing with the Ouija board. In the before. house when you lived there? Yes. That's when we all believe it all broke loose. They did it secretly. They borrowed it from somebody. And then my mother found out about it. That made her really mad. She got that Ouija board and she went outside and she broke it on her knee and threw it away. So later, I understand that that's not the way you get rid of them. So, you know, there's these different things you should do. And so it, it left that portal open. All these years later, we looked it up. A couple of us who were trying to study, I'm not a demonologist, but I just, from experience of feeling the difference between a ghost, a person who I think is a person and what is not. So it's just, you know, with that house, it, it just continues to be, you know, bewilder everybody because it's hard to find records of what could have happened then. I mean, we don't really know why it's so haunted. In the woman that you encountered there, did she feel kind of protective, not evil, even though she disappeared through the floor, which would be extremely frightening? <laughs> but but did- she did it in prayer. I could hear her uh, singing some nights, and because it was so, everybody was so on edge that because I was, you know, like I said, you know, uh, kindergarten, first grade, I was like, I slept with different people every night because people were afraid. Uh, when I was sleeping with my sister Stella. I woke up and she doesn't wake up and I could hear her singing. And when we were going through the exorcism, I could hear her singing. And then the, the guy came behind her 
And I actually did capture the picture of the ghost in my old house. That book came out in 2004. And I took that picture going back in 2007, I think. And it's exactly how I described it in the book, which is awesome. So with that background and where you live, too, in Bisbee, it's in Cochise County. That's got such a colorful past. Did it take a while before you realized, wow, we're not the only haunted house in this town. There are other things going on here. I used to be a reporter. And during some of the time, uh, it was in the 90s, 1990s. You know, I did hard news and covered high school and did all kinds of stuff. So I would want to write features sometimes. And then I asked my editor, do you mind if I write about ghosts? And it wasn't cool yet. It wasn't in yet. And she's like, well, let's see how, you know, go ahead. And so I started writing about some of the things that I, you know, knew of. And the reception was incredible. So that's when I knew that, yeah, we weren't the only ones because it was taboo back then. Mm -hmm. No one really liked to talk about ghosts. But so after that, I started, decided to go ahead and write about my uh, life growing up and being growing up with the paranormal. So I wrote that first book. So that was the opening of me realizing how haunted Bisbee was. Because you were also a paranormal historian. I would think your journalism background will help you look into these stories of hauntings. Oh, definitely. I think, in fact, if you probably read my books, you'll see that's I'm writing AP style. (laughs) You know, I'm trained knowing how to research, being careful with my sources, my interviews, when I interview people. So, yeah, it all ties in. That's why it's so important to get it right, uh, to make sure when I do write stories, uh, is for the you know haunted uh, series and anything else I write, I make sure that I have backup for everything as far as history goes. And then as far as people who share their experiences, you can't deny a person's experience with the paranormal supernatural. So whatever uh, stories, it, you know, it wraps up into the truth and whatever the truth is. If you're going to be telling um, tales, Make sure that everyone knows that this is just for fun and, you know, um, whatever. But if you are uh, saying that this is true history and this is what happened here, that's where I have to make sure this is what happened here. And I think it makes it to me more interesting to know the history and the hauntings. Where you live and where I live, we have some very similar people and probably some of the exact same people. Because my town was a cow town back in the day, saloons and brothels and gunfights in the streets. Same with your area. And so when you talk about some of these hauntings, there's some interesting history that goes with your area of the country. Yes. And and I was able to easily tie communities together. For example, well, uh, Cochise County was actually created back in 1881. And it was named after a Cherokee Apache named Cochise. And uh, this was before Arizona actually became a state because we became a state in 1912. The most famous piece of Wild West we have in Arizona is the uh, the shootout at the OK Corral. I was lucky enough to have a rapport with the owner of the OK Corral, and that's Mr. Love. He and his family actually... Uh, was part of the the ones who got on board to recreate Tombstone from when it was most famous. Uh, the OK Corral shootout actually took place in 1881 in October. If you ever been there, if you ever get to go there, you know, it's a, the original building. They try to keep it as logistically landmarked as possible. When you walk into the front, because they have the gunfights out in the back and they recreate that all day long, it's really cool. There is um, a sighting of a judge that people have seen. Tourists on different occasions, they mostly see him in the evening. His name is uh, James Burnett. And he is described as having a shrubby beard and a long coat. They see him walking. And people from across the street, tourists, will say, excuse me, because there's nobody else. And they'll ask where something is. And he'll turn around. And then he'll turn around and keep going. What happened to him is in front of the OK Corral, he was shot and killed. He was uh, shot and killed by Colonel William C. Green. 
Colonel Green, he was uh, a gentleman who had some property over on the San Pedro River near Tombstone. Those two had a long going water argument. And so they had some fights in public. And at the time, Tombstone was the county seat. And so a lot of people were down in Tombstone because of the courthouse. And until one um, afternoon in July, his wife, Mr. Green's wife, and his daughter, Ella, and her friend, Katie, they went swimming in the river like they always did. Except for uh, around the time they were, the girls were jumping in the river, um, the dam had been broken. And so a flash flood came and the two girls drowned. Mr. Green was so upset, you know, so mad, and he blamed it on the judge and so he put out, if anybody sees him, I'm looking for him. So it just so happens when they were in Tombstone, he saw the judge, Mr. Green. And at one o'clock on July 1st in 1897, in front of the OK Corral, Green fired three rounds and killed Burnett. Witnesses actually reported that Burnett's body was found face down a pool of blood. And when his body was turned over, blood spurted from the gunshot wound in his chest. It was pretty graphic. Well, uh, Green was arrested almost immediately. And uh, back then, they didn't worry about talking to a lawyer first. A reporter went right in and asked him, you know, what happened and why he did it. I actually have a statement that Mr. Green put. He said, I have, I have no statement to make other than the man. That man was the cause of my child being drowned. I am certain beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was the guilty man. And when I thought of my little girl as she put her arms around my neck on the day she drowned, I could think of nothing but vengeance on the man who caused her death. I have lived in this territory 25 years and have always been a peaceful, law-abiding man. I had no animosity and have no regret for anything except the death of my little girl and the little Cochran girl and the grief of my poor wife. And then he said, vengeance is mine. I will repay with the Lord. He was put on a bond for $30,000. And in short, he, his trial was pretty much over as it began. He had the backing of the whole community and they just let him go. Uh, yeah, I think that's you know interesting. So that's back to the tombstone ghost, the man he killed. And according to um a video uh, by a gentleman named Michael Valenzuela. He claims to be a descendant of Judge Burnett. Um, it was an opportunity to give their side of the story because, you know, the papers pretty much just gave Green's side of the story. So um, Mr. Valenzuela says his ancestor said that the surrounding neighbors um, were all in talks with Mr. Green regarding the water that he apparently was damming upstream from his property. And Burnett allegedly was willing to pay for a solution as the judge needed the water for his cattle. Well, Burnett and another gentleman, they got together and devised a plan to reroute their water through Green's property and then through the judges. And it's claimed that before they could finish the project, there was a flash flood that unfortunately took out Green's dam. And this is when Green's daughter, Ella, and her friend Katie were swimming in the river and when they drowned. That might explain why Judge Burnett is in confusion and why he got shot. They said that he actually was, he went into the jail to go check up on a local drunk. And so when he came out, that's when he got shot and killed. So that might exp explain why that judge is haunting that area. Cause he's, he's confused. Why, if this is true, it was an accident, yeah. but green thought saw it another way. And Bisbee at the grave site of the green family, they have the, the daughter and the, and the, um, the wife, but he's not buried there. There was a deal, and it's recorded that Mr. Green, because he was very wealthy, he said when they his uh, daughters and his wife, or daughter and his wife died, that he would uh, fence off the entire cemetery, which is called Evergreen Cemetery. And it has a wrought iron fence that goes around it. And the only thing he asked was that, that somebody maintains this is a family plot. So you can see throughout time that the city of Bisbee will say the green plot looks good but if it's not if there's weeds in it um, people have said they've seen a gentleman walk around that plot or they'll hear heavy footsteps walk around that plot oh. so it's just really crazy 
Yeah. So it's crazy how so many places, two places could be haunted with the same group of people in different towns. And I also see how it could happen because it stems back to this one incident. One man not really understanding it. The other man's got a broken heart and his daughter and wife died. You know, his life will never be the same. So I get why he wants vengeance. And then that's the times too. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of street justice back then. There is an interesting story I wanted you to talk about. There's a hotel, the Avenue Hotel, and there's a ghost of a young woman there who was murdered. It's almost a mystery. The Avenue Hotel, and it opened back in 1901 as the Railroad Hotel. It was mostly uh, a clientele to the El Paso Southwestern Railroad uh, because that was just across the way. They had a huge uh, train station. Then it closed, and um, a woman named Robin owns it now, and uh, she's owned it since back in 2007. She's very open about the stories of ghosts there, and uh, the main one is um, a young woman uh, named Mabel. And she was 18. She was married very young. She had a little boy, a toddler. She was married to a bullfighter. <laughs> And he abandoned her, and so uh, she ended up with another gentleman. So she started working at the Avenue Hotel as a uh, maid. She was really popular, well-liked, um, but this guy who wasn't her husband but acted like her husband, people around her said that he was very controlling, maybe abusive. So he was working in New Mexico, and so when he leave. Uh, she was, you know, happy. She went to uh, the bar that was inside and, you know, had a couple of beers. She was with uh, another person who worked there. They said that all of a sudden she felt lightheaded. She wanted to go lay down. And the bartender thought that was weird because she has more. That's like what she usually drinks, maybe two. And so she went to her room the next morning. They went to wake her up and they couldn't wake her up. And according to some of the news articles and to uh, what Robin said, the owner, they said that she had overdosed on morphine. Uh, the gentleman that was uh, her, they say husband, not husband, was Frank Farrell. And they were very shocked because she didn't have, they couldn't see why she would do that to herself. And especially being a mom. It turns out they had an inquest and they think that Farrell actually gave her the morphine. Um, she died. Now, this young woman has uh, made herself in the presence of Robin many times. She talks to her often, and she says some of the things that uh, she's done, the ghost, is when um, Robin was getting ready to open up the hotel, you know, painting, uh, doing whatever she was doing. She had a bunch of people there, and one of her friends in Douglas came in and said, do you mind if we use your dining room because she has a restaurant uh, in the same hotel, if uh, these two gentlemen can have a meeting there, because it's the most private. And she's like, okay, yeah, sure. But, you know, we're going to continue to work. And they said, okay. And so these guys, one of the gentlemen, he um, had just sold some of his property outside of Douglas. So they were having a little argument about the right of way road, who was going to maintain it. So the guy who sold it said, you know, I'll maintain it, but you know, you're going to pay me. As Robin was in the kitchen with other people, she had a shelf full of plates and all of a sudden they came crashing off and uh, fell and shattered all over the floor. There, no one else was there. Nobody could do that like that. Her friend was there and she said, Robin, I got to leave, but they're good. They can continue to meet. Right. And she's like, yeah. And she's like, did you hear what happened? And she's like, yeah, but I'll call me about it later. So she took off. So the gentleman left, and so she, uh, Robin did talk to her friend, and she said, I just wanted to tell you what happened before I left. She said, yeah, I heard the crashing, and uh, Robin said, I think it was Mabel. And she says, I know it was, she said, because these two gentlemen were arguing, and it got so heated that they both had sidearms, and they both stood up, and they put their hands on their guns, and then the crashing of the plates happened. Oh. So, so then they... And so they stopped and they sat back down like they realized, you know, whoa, okay. They took off in peace. And and so she is in gratitude to this ghost because after that, she started to connect 
if there was arguments or just things like that, a lamp would tip over or, uh, you know, anything to get their attention away from it. So that's how uh, Robin, the owner, thinks about the ghost and, and then connecting back to her lover, Frank. That's what she must have been living through. I really believe she did not commit suicide. I really believe that man had something to do with it. She's a, a good spirit. Life after death, she's trying to help as a young person. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with Francine Powers. We'll have more in our next episode about the hauntings in Cochise County in southeastern Arizona. And if you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, try everything commercial-free. Become a Gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts, and you can try it for three days free. Go to patreon.com slash thegravetalks. You can find everything there, also ad-free. And for all of us at The Grave Talks, I'm Carol Hughes. Thanks for listening.